This week, the Swiss army has banned all encrypted messengers except one. I think you'll like what they had to say there. Uh, there is a new iOS fake reboot exploit you probably want to know about. Norton has made headlines for their crypto miner, and Mozilla does not really know what to do with cryptocurrencies. Welcome to Surveillance Support 70, where we are dedicated to keeping you private and secure with the latest news. This report recaps some of the most notable events in the last week. I am Henry from Techlore. I am Nathan from The New Oil. And this week, we are going to highlight our communities as a way of supporting us. If you want to get involved with other like-minded privacy people who are interested in privacy and often have really good insight and ideas and feedback, then be sure to consider joining one of our communities. For the new oil, we pretty much just have a matrix room or a couple of matrix rooms, but Henry has a few more options as well. We also have a matrix room and we also have a Discord, uh, which are all bridged together. So for people who use Discord, you can join on Discord, or if you're on Matrix, you can join through Matrix. Um, and also we do have a Signal community, but that's only for patrons. And uh, that's pretty much it. With that, we will start with data breaches and strap in, because this is one of those weeks where we got a whole ton of them. Oh yeah. We're gonna start off. <laughs> We're going to start off in South Florida, where Broward Health has disclosed a data breach affecting 1.3 million people. This is a Florida-based healthcare system with over 30 locations. They offer a variety of medical services and have over 60,000 admissions per year. This breach happened back in October. Data included full names, date of birth, physical and email addresses, phone numbers, financial information, social security numbers, insurance information, medical history, including condition, treatment, and diagnosis, and driver's license numbers. Whew. According to the article, the data has not been misused yet, quote unquote, but the article does point out that it's still entirely possible that it's too early to say whether or not it will end up in the wild, which it almost certainly will. Broward Health has advised employees to change passwords and is offering a whopping two years of free credit protection via Experian. So based on the whole changing passwords thing, this was probably a phishing attack. Our next story comes from New York, where the Office of the Attorney General has warned 17 well-known companies that roughly 1.1 million of their customers have had their accounts compromised in credential stuffing attacks. They discovered these compromised accounts online after a quote, sweeping investigation over several months, monitoring multiple online communities dedicated to sharing validated credentials harvested in previously undetected attacks. According to a report from Akami back in May of last year, the company being a commie, observed over 193 billion credential stuffing attacks globally in 2020. Then that's 45% more than in 2019. The point being, this kind of stuff is unfortunately on the rise, credential stuffing, which is why it is so important to not reuse your credentials and make sure you are using unique passwords everywhere. Have I Been Pwned is an open source database with pretty much pwned in other words, hacked information, and they have warned of that PIF data breach, which has impacted millions of people. Datpiff, I believe I'm saying that correctly, if not, let me know, is a rap mixtape hosting site with over 15 million users. This breach impacts about half of those users and first appeared on sites in July of 2020. This includes email addresses, passwords, usernames, and security questions. Uh, side note, but make sure your security questions are not the actual answers to them. We recommend using a password manager for your security questions or something that only you're gonna know. At this time, Datpiff has not warned users to reset passwords, which is a big red flag. Uh, moral of the story here, make sure you use unique passwords and unique security questions and try to check on Have I Been Pwned as much as you can. Up next, Flexbooker has disclosed a data breach with almost 4 million accounts impacted. Flexbooker is a US-based appointment scheduling service used by everything from accountants, lawyers, and doctors to mechanics, barbers, and salons. So this breach happened a few days before Christmas and includes names, emails, phone numbers, password salt and hash, driver's license photos, payment forms, and more. Data was stored on AWS, but we're not sure if that was the cause. So we're doing like half a shot for that one. <laughs> Um, also, as a side note, but I feel like if I'm going to launch uh, any kind of attack like this, I think a few days before Christmas is probably the best time to do it. Just no mercy. Hypothetically. Huh? Just ruin everybody's hy holidays. Hypothetically, of course. <laughs> well, hypothetically, you don't have to be a monster. I'm just saying. True. Ruin hey, everybody's holidays, Just man. not enough people have been joining the Patreon lately, man. <laughs> it's been hard. <laughs> Okay, our next data breach is going to come from the U.S. online online pharmacy Ravku, who uh, this one is AWS related. So go ahead and take a full shot. 
Ravku is, like I said, a U.S.-based, internet-based pharmacy service. The breach happened in September of 2021, and they sent notification letters to 105,000 customers, so presumably that's how many were impacted. They have not yet disclosed what information was affected, but they were very adamant the social security number was not infected, affected because they say that they don't store social security number on this particular portal. I guess that logic checks out. They're probably telling the truth about that one, but there may be, of course, other valuable information like dates of birth and prescription information and stuff like that. As usual, they are offering one year of free credit monitoring to make up for this. Only a year? Oh, man. I know, right? Everybody else is offering two. Yeah. Rookie numbers. You got to pump those up. <laughs> Our next story comes from the Pacific Northwest, where Mick, I'm so going to screw this up, McMenamins uh, is a, quote, dining and hospitality empire who suffered a data breach that infect, affected 12 years of employee info, which is obnoxious. So this happened on December 12th. This was a ransomware attack and exposed records from January 1st, 1998 through January 30th of 2010. We have listeners who were not alive when this data started being recorded. That's insane. The data included names, physical and email address, telephone numbers, dates of birth, race, ethnicity, gender, disability status, medical notes, performance notes, social security number, health insurance plans, income amounts, and retirement contributions, uh, possibly direct deposit information too. Customer data was not affected. This was only employees. So this probably came from like the HR department. They are notifying everyone involved and are offering assistance to all employees. The article did not specify what that assistance was, but probably like free credit monitoring and stuff like that. So the lesson, in my opinion, this is why I'm paranoid at work. You know, I, I don't give them my real address. I give them a PO box, which I've never had issues with, by the way. I don't know. I don't like to fill out gender if that's optional. Uh, I don't like to fill out like veteran status or anything like that. I don't know. I just, I try to give them as little information as possible. And this is a main reason why. US Cellular has disclosed data breach after a billing system hack. This was self-described as the fourth largest wireless carrier in the US. The breach occurred uh, in December 13th through December 19th, 2021. It impacted about 405 individuals, um, or at least those are the only people being notified. And that included names, addresses, pins, phone numbers, and info about wireless service plans, usage, and billing statements. Some numbers were also ported. Red flag. The company reset an undisclosed number of retail employee passwords and customer security questions, answers, and pins. US Cellular also had a breach in January 2021. And I think the moral here is we, we always recommend prepaid when you can, uh, and always just trying to limit the information you share with these services. Uh, it personally, if my prepaid self plan has a breach, I really don't care, personally. It's like everything they have is completely fake, so. Um, that's kind of the vibe. Up next, a data skimmer has hit over 100 real estate websites. So skims aren't breaches, but the effect is pretty similar. In this case, attackers have compromised a video player and injected malicious code to skim a user data. They harvested names, emails, and phone numbers from the impacted websites. Um, I would recommend going into the sources to see what exactly the sites were that were impacted. Most of these sites were defunct, um, so not too much to worry about, but remove unused and unwanted stuff. And finally, last but not least, we have an update to a data breach. Morgan Stanley has agreed to pay $60 million to settle a data breach lawsuit. Morgan Stanley is an American financial services company. The article didn't specify when the data breaches in this particular suit occurred. I tried my best to find out, but I couldn't quite get a clear answer. They said that there were two of them and the lawsuit was filed in July of 2020 and it affected 15 million current and former clients. The data was apparently leaked when old computers and devices were decommissioned. I guess they were not scrubbed properly and therefore things like social security number and birth date and possibly more information were on these devices that were basically just, I don't know, thrown out or given to Goodwill or something. Yeah, Morgan Stanley has agreed to a $60 million settlement. Uh, last I checked, it still has to be approved by a judge, but you know, probably will be. So yeah, just, Weird how the information gets out there, man. Just people not cleaning out old computers and stuff like that. Crazy. And now that was the end of data breaches. Very long week, um, but all the other categories are much shorter. Next up is companies. And this is the highlight story of the week. So the Swiss army has banned all chat apps, but locally developed Threema. The army is now requiring soldiers to use Threema instead of Signal, Telegram, and WhatsApp. It will pay the subscription fee on behalf of soldiers because Threema is not a free app to download. Um, however, the interesting thing is there are no penalties for using those other instant messaging services. So while there is 
kind of a quote ban there's also no penalties for violating that ban which is very interesting um maybe they'll change that down the road maybe it's a transitional thing or maybe it's just kind of a loosey-goosey rule but either way this move is primarily driven by the fact that threema requires no user data to sign up like a phone number or email address threema is also not subject to the u.s cloud act which exempts u.s state agencies from needing a search warrant to access online data the article also points out that threema is not fully open source, especially on the server side, nor is it decentralized. So the article that talks about this also recommends checking out Session, Matrix, and Briar. And um, we also have a really great messenger comparison on the TechLore channel. Just type in TechLore messenger comparison, and we have like, I think 11 different messengers compared, including all of these services here. Um, but overall, it's kind of nice to see um, Threema get some love because it's definitely a little bit less popular. Our next story is about Twilio. We're sharing this one because Twilio is very popular in the privacy community. It's a little bit more advanced to set up, but some people like to go directly through Twilio because uh, it gives you more control over that number and there's less chance of losing that number as opposed to using a more mainstream voice over IP solution. So there was a, a user on Hacker News who reported that he, he or she uses Twilio for their work. They own a small business or whatever. And one time they received a spam text and Twilio immediately suspended their account and didn't notify them or anything because they were worried that there was possibly fraudulent access to the account. Twilio is kind of notorious for not having great customer service in, in the sense of like, uh, they don't have like a phone number you can call. You have to submit a ticket and it kind of takes a while. They're a little slow to respond. He did eventually get a response. I think he said it took about three hours. And Twilio basically explained that because of the nature of their business and their business model, they are under a lot of pressure from telecoms to not make the spam problem worse. So they tend to be very aggressive about cracking down on possible like fraudulent access and spam users. So yeah, we just wanted to share this with you guys because again, Twilio is very popular in the privacy community, but it does come with some drawbacks. You know, they're under a lot of pressure to not make any mistakes. So if you decide to go the Twilio route, just be aware of what the risks are and make sure that you are staying on top of your account and keeping a good eye on it. And our final company news story this week you probably have heard about. If not, let's get into it. Pretty much, Norton Antivirus recently started hitting headlines because of its crypto miner story. And the headline for this new article is, here's the truth about the crypto miner that comes with Norton Antivirus. So Norton actually publicly announced this feature over six months ago where essentially it does crypto mining in the background on your computer. It is also opt-in, so it's not something that just happens magically in the background when you up install an update. So it wasn't as sneaky as people like to really uh, make it seem. Um, it wasn't installed in a sneaky way and it's not on by default. Despite this, neither of us like Norton. Neither of us like most antiviruses. We still recommend you don't use Norton, but we try to at least keep the news uh, factual here. So and that's kind of why we threw that in there, just to clear some things up. We still hate Norton though. That will take us into the research section where this week we just have a couple of Apple stories. So the first one says Apple iOS vulnerable to HomeKit door lock denial of service bug. The researcher who published this story claims that Apple has known about this since August and has done nothing to fix it. So they're kind of publishing the story to pressure Apple to take some action. Apple does say that they are working on it and they are expecting to release a fix in quote early 2022. So who knows when that'll be. The basics of this attack are that an attacker can change the name of an Apple HomeKit device and basically make it way too long, which bugs out Apple and makes it not work right because they have a certain limit that the names are supposed to be, and essentially locks up the phone. This can be done remotely via a malicious app, for example, which is one of the reasons that we keep saying not to, you know, to be careful with the apps that you download and don't just download things for any old reason. They did say there were defenses, but they didn't actually say what any of them were. I think the best defense is probably not to use iCloud. As, as always, you know, if you're not using HomeKit, then this is not an issue. And as I mentioned, vet your apps. Always make sure that you actually need it. You're getting it from an official source and it is legit. Which, I mean, granted, with Apple, is kind of hard to not get it from an official source, but point being, make sure that you actually need it in the first place and you're not just filling your phone with useless apps. It's interesting. I feel like um, there, there there are very valid criticisms about iOS and Apple, but I still think overall Apple generally nails privacy and security overall better than most Android devices. But disabling iCloud and limiting iCloud usage genuinely solves a wide majority of problems on iOS. 
that people complain Agreed. about, like um, non unencrypted backups being probably the largest yeah. one. Boom, I got off, not a problem. Um, Apple's access to your files in the cloud via iCloud Drive. If you're not using iCloud, it's not a big deal. Um, it just seems like iCloud is kind of a good central place for a lot of problems that people have with Apple. So just highlighting the, that. Uh, you can feel free to cut this if you want. Wasn't wasn't the fappening caused by Apple's unencrypted backups? I've actually heard multiple stories about how the fappening was executed. Um, but yes, all of them were, the, the main ones were like, they were able to pretty much clone um, the unencrypted backup onto an actual new iPhone. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Um, and yes, so that was also done through iCloud. And I believe the phishing, some people say it was a phishing attack, um, which would have also yeah, I've heard that too. been done over iCloud. Um, so yeah. It just seems like iCloud is a very nice place to really target individuals, as most cloud providers are. But Apple doesn't, unfortunately, Fair. solve many of the problems that other cloud providers have as well. Our next story is about an attack called No Reboot, where researchers have found out that basically you can make an iPhone look like it is rebooting, when in reality it is not. And the reason for this, or the reason this attack would be interesting, is because Apple is notorious, and I, I think Android as well, but I could be wrong, they're kind of notorious for the fact that if you restart the phone, that's gonna kill 99% of malware because most malware is not sophisticated enough to be persistent on reboot because of the security and the way the phones are designed. And obviously there are exceptions to that, but most of them generally speaking. So this would be an interesting attack because it would allow you to, if you're someone like me who restarts your phone, uh, I do it once a week, then I could be, hypothetically, under the false assumption that my phone is fine, when in reality it never actually shut down. I read both the article and the actual research paper, and I wasn't able to figure out how likely this attack is, in the sense like, does this, can this be remotely done, or does it require physical access? I don't know, unfortunately. The good news is that the attack itself only seems to do the fake reboot. The bad news is, of course, you can link that with other malicious programs that can do things like enable the microphone or steal your credentials. So the last piece of silver lining is the researchers said that the only way they found to get around this is a force restart. So like if your phone freezes up and you forcibly restart it, there's a, I forget how to do that. They say how to do it on the newest iPhone models, but there's a way to like force it to reboot. And it's it's almost like a, on a, a traditional computer, it's kind of like holding the, the power button until it shuts off. If you're worried about this, then force reboots are probably the way to go. I don't know, maybe someone can weigh in and say whether that's bad advice. I don't know if that no, risks any data loss or anything like that, but. No, that's fine. I, okay. I, I used well. to do those force reboots all the time on my iPhone, as long as you're not doing anything like editing a document that's not saved. Just make sure you're on your home gotcha. screen and everything's good and just do a force restart. It used to be hold the home button and power button at the same time for like five to 10 yeah. seconds, but I don't know what the new one is. I think now are. they said it's like volume and power or something like that. I can't remember, but it's it's in the article. So, well, there you go. Yeah, so if you're worried about this, then uh, force restart your phone once a week, and hopefully that should carry you over until Apple finds a way to actually fix this for in a proper way. All right, and now we're gonna transition into the politics section. So there's a new law that has been passed in the US which will install kill switches in all of new cars. So this is an update to a story we discussed in the past. Essentially, the U.S. has now finally passed a law that requires some changes to future cars being manufactured. Among the changes is a kill switch so that law enforcement can disable cars remotely, as well as to monitor for evidence of driver impairment. I actually have not checked in with Nathan, but I, I assume I'm, I'm going to say how I think we stand on this, and then Nathan can chime in, but I'm fairly certain this is the kind of thing that sounds like a great idea. Um, I think that the ability to turn off someone who's um, on a road rampage sounds fantastic, definitely solves some problems, but um, also is going to come along with a lot of consequences as well. Like how, um, what kind of data do law enforcement have? What kind of access do they have remotely? How do we know this isn't being abused? Is there any oversight over this? So many questions. Um, how Will this open up security issues because now you're going to have to have some kind of channel between the car and law enforcement? So there's so many question marks and um, definitely some uh, causes of concern there, in my opinion. I agree 100%. Yeah, like, and the article even points that out. Like, sure, there are times this would be useful, like a high-speed chase or something like that. But at the same time, like, monitoring for evidence of driver impairment, like, how many... How, I, I, I say this sarcastically, I just can't wait for that to go wrong and somebody is unable to start their car in the middle of an emergency because they're hysterical, because they're in a life or death situation. Or, you know, like, 
we don't even know how laws could change. Like the article cites in New Zealand where a couple people got pulled over and I, I think, I don't know if they got arrested, but they got in trouble because it was locked down and they were bringing fast food to some of their friends in another city. Anyways, all that just to say, yeah, I agree with you. Like, it has legitimate uses, but there's also a lot of concerns over when will it be used and what's the oversight and all of that. So, all right, so our next story comes from Europe where Google and Facebook have been fined 150 million euros and 60 million euros each in France. Yes, there it is in the headline. So this was handed down because regulators were made aware of, uh, these are called dark patterns, Google and Facebook and I'm sure you guys see this all the time, you go to a website and it says, hey, we use cookies, do you consent to this? And there's one button that says, yeah, no problem. But then if you want to see the cookies or say no or pick which cookies, that's buried like three menus in. And it's super annoying. And uh, France basically said like, no, we don't allow that, that's against our privacy regulations. We're finding both of you and you have to make the opt out button clearly visible just like the opt in button. You can't play that game like that so good for france and our final political news of the week an italian mafia fugitive was arrested in spain after a google street view sighting um man gio 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 Achino. gio gio i feel like it's gio gio Achino gamino i think you're right i also just wanted to be noted this man's name sounds so fake it's <laughs> Geo, like if you named if you name somebody <laughs> that in a movie nowadays, you would get sued for racism. <laughs> Geo, like that's Geo, a stereotypical name. Geo Achino Gamino, I love it. Okay, that's that's the best I got too. All right, Geo Achino Gamino is an Italian mafia boss who's been hiding for twenty years. He was spotted on Google Street View though in the Spanish town of Galapagar. Okay, so police noted a man chatting at a street vendor looked like him, and they tracked down the vendor's Facebook page where he was recognized by the scar on his chin. They do claim to have already had a good lead on where he was and that the street view was just confirmation. Um, it is just interesting though, because I feel like it's not very common for us to hear about a Google street view um, kind of case where someone was actually found by that, especially since when we go in Google street view, all the faces are blurred. So that actually does confirm that uh, police are able to gain access to unblurred photograph photographs uh, from Google Street View, which is interesting. That's kind of it. And now let's transition into FOSS, free and open source news. And this one, wow. Um, first off, I just want to start by saying this is incredibly split. This mostly took place on Twitter, and no joke, half of them are just like, go Mozilla, go! And the other half are like, wow, you guys are fools, cowards, hate you. So it's a very split thing. Um, we're going to try to break it down here. So Mozilla has temporarily stopped crypto donations over climate impact concerns. Mozilla posted a tweet early in 2022, so like, within the last week, letting people know that they are now accepting cryptocurrency donations, right? Um, they were accepting Bitcoin, Ethereum, and I believe Dogecoin as well. <laughs> so they sent out a tweet that they are for the first time ever accepting crypto donations. Then they were immediately met with a flurry of backlash of people complaining that cryptocurrency is bad for the climate. So... Among other things. Yeah, as well as other things. So Mozilla now, I think yesterday or two days ago from recording this, sent out a new tweet saying they're pausing crypto donations while they're reconsidering their decision. That's it. That's the whole story. We're not working on anything else. Anything else you hear about this story is likely just community-based stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to chime in my opinion here. We are actually talking about this yesterday, Nathan and I. We both have read and heard mixed things about crypto's impact on the environment. Um, and I think it really comes down to values. And also, I personally haven't looked too much into the data. However, what I'm kind of upset about is there's like so many things that Mozilla is like, they do a questionable decision, the community explodes, Mozilla doesn't care, and they just proceed with what they were doing. But this is where the line was drawn. Um, so I'm a little upset about that personally. But you know what, like it's their organization. If they don't, don't want to take crypto, I don't really care too much. Um, but Nate, definitely let me know. I think you kind of summed it up really well. Um, I, like I told you yesterday, I have mostly only heard stories about crypto being bad for the environment because of how much energy it takes. Um, I did a little bit of Zcash mining a couple years ago and I never noticed a spike in electricity or anything like that. 
I also have a very crappy, like I was just using an old computer that was laying around. It was like, hey, sure, make me some money while you're at it. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat as you. Like I, I've i heard that it's bad for the environment, but I've also never like actually taken the time to stop and look into it. You kind of pointed it out, and that's when I was like, oh yeah, that's a really good point. Like you said, like it's kind of weird that this is where they choose to start listening to people when they've like blown off so many other concerns before. I don't know. It's It's... It is interesting to see the reactions, though, because like you said, like people are feeling very heated about this. Like people have very strong opinions. So I don't know. Well, uh, I, I guess we'll just keep tabs on it. And, you know, as we learn new things, if we learn anything new, we'll let you know. But yeah. And, and yeah. you know what? I'm going to I'm going to come forward here with some bias. I'm going to try to say this in as, as least of a hippie way as possible. I love our planet. <laughs> I love the environment. And I'm very passionate about environmental problems. And this is something I do need to research because of this, because it's something I'm passionate about. However, what really kind of pisses me off is you don't hear people get this angry about any other kind of like actually scientifically proven in every case scenario, negative thing for our environment. You don't hear this kind of hate for um, the fossil fuel industry, I feel when you have all these companies that are contributing to fossil fuel industries, you don't hear people go on about that. You don't hear people talk about how um, even if cryptocurrencies are really bad for the environment, how it would be less of a problem if the whole internet was built on renewable energy. Um, you don't talk about how um, eating meat is so bad for the, for the planet. Like there's just so many things that people like fail to neglect when they just choose to pick on this, which in fairness to the crypto peeps, I can see how that's infuriating. Someone's like tweeting from their iPhone you know, that's using lots of like, uh, non-sustainable resources, you know, and they're talking about how, you know, bad cryptocurrency is for the environment. So I feel like there's a lot of double standards. Eating a hamburger. Yeah. There's a lot of double standards and pretty much I want to do research on this to really figure out like how bad it is, how bad it compares to other things. And I don't know, I'm, I'm open to seeing what this is all about. Um, definitely a controversial story though. So it'd be really great to hear some of your guys' thoughts in the comments. All right. Next up, on the other side of the spectrum, Brave has passed 50 million monthly active users, growing 2x for the fifth year in a row. Aside from this, Brave Search now has 2.3 billion annual queries, which is, I, I don't know how many that is. I don't know if that's a lot or a little, but billions sounds like a lot. So um, nice job. There's also a bunch of other stuff we can share, but those are kind of the main points. So definitely check out Brave's m major marketing of how big they're getting in the comments. Okay, our next story says a new future for GNU PG. For those who don't know, you may have heard of something called PGP, which is pretty good privacy, and it is, uh, for better or worse, it is one of the most common ways to encrypt, like, emails, for example. Uh, I know ProtonMail is built on G uh, PGP, C Templar is built on PGP, and I think Tuta Nota said they use a modified version of PGP that they've specially modified. So yeah, it's kind of everywhere. Again, for better or worse, I know some people have some complaints with it. GNU Privacy Guard is a program that helps you use PGP directly, if especially if you don't want to use like a Linux command line. Long story short, this is a whole blog post about the future of GNU Privacy Guard, but the short version is they are now financially stable and they are encouraging supporters to donate to other projects who need it instead. If I understood this right, because I was kind of curious why they were saying like, hey, stop donating to us. I believe they are now sustained via government contracts in Germany. The government has contracted with them to basically handle all of their email security kind of stuff. Again, that they are encouraging people to donate to other projects because now they don't need the money anymore. And they will also use this support to update GPG, which, I'm hoping we'll solve some of the security issues that some people have talked about that I mentioned before, but we will see. Long story short, they are now financially stable, which is amazing. Not many open source can pro projects can say that, so good for them. Up next, Signal's cryptocurrency feature has gone worldwide. MobileCoin, I'm sure many of you remember that, um, is now available worldwide. The founder now says there are, quote, thousands of daily transactions versus just dozens before the beta release. The article says there are still challenges to getting started using it, such as few exchanges that support mobile coin and that are available in all countries. The EFF is calling this a privacy win, interestingly enough, and I personally couldn't really care less. I will continue using Signal without mobile coin. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure many of you listening will too as well. And the final story, okay, this one I didn't type out notes for, so work with me, people. So, Panquake, Panquake, Panquake. 
Panquake is kind of like a Twitter alternative. It's a social media platform. They're trying to be blockchain based and they're trying to do things in a federated uh, way where essentially it's like open rules. You're not just gonna get banned over uh, anything that Twitter decides is good or bad. It's supposed to be like an open network. Um, check out their website. We'll leave it in the sources as we always do. But pretty much the people behind Panquake um, were trying to gain a Twitter handle, like an actual Panquake Twitter handle. They previously had Pan uh, underscore Quake. And essentially, Twitter was completely working with them. They gave them uh, the handle, and then out of nowhere, Twitter just permanently suspended all accounts involved in the process. So the suspension notice claimed these accounts were, quote, violating our rules against evading permanent suspension. After that, Panquake filed tons of reports and appeals being rejected by automated replies that either stated either stated the, perma, the permaban again or just made no sense. After all the uproar, because they have a pretty big community, by the way, like keep in mind Panquake is kind of a competitor to Twitter. After all the uproar, Sean O'Brien, who's someone that we've had um, interviewed on Techler before, He's a cybersecurity slash privacy expert. He has taught with the Yale Privacy Lab. He is fantastic. Um, his account was then restricted by Twitter, as well as the Yale Privacy Lab's account was also restricted. So everyone like kind of involved with this is now being restricted by Twitter and it's kind of sketchy. We're sharing this as kind of just publicity towards it because they're not you know, they're still dealing with this problem to this day. So we really encourage you to check out sources and view their article that they wrote about this, talking about what happened. Um, they put out a recent announcement. They're still steamrolling ahead and they're going to have a working prototype soon. Um, so go ahead and check out, check out all of that below. Um, either this is just a massive mess up on Twitter's end, or it's like pretty directly, you know, anti-competitive stuff going on. We're probably never going to formally know. And that brings us to our final section, Misfits. We're gonna start with another story from Hacker News, which says salary data is for sale. This is just another privacy PSA. Equifax, yes, that Equifax from the 2017 data breach that I still am waiting for my $10 from, is tracking your salary and selling it to pretty much whoever wants to know it. This information is being reported. In some cases, they suspect it's coming from like uh, when you apply for a loan or a mortgage, you have to put that kind of information in and your bank is probably selling that back to Equifax, who is then adding that to your profile and will show it to Again, certain people who purchase that information. One person did note that you might be able to opt out of this under the CCPA. So if you live in California, go ahead and look into that. For everyone else, it's just something to be aware of. Just know that that is out there. And our final story, this is just kind of one of those fun ones to leave you with. It says US arrest suspect who stole unpublished books in phishing attacks. So since 2016, a man named Filippo Bernardini used his experience working in the publishing industry along with fraudulent domain names to create phishing emails and trick publishers, authors, and others into sending him unreleased copies of books. Now, to be fair, this this does actually have a dark side. This isn't just <laughs> funny. Uh, he could sell those books on the black market and that could undermine sales of legitimate copies, which, I mean, I as a nerd, someone who loves books, that's kind of messed up. I, I want my authors to get the money that they're owed. That has got to be the nerdiest crime I've ever heard of. It's so strange. Um, it really is. It's so weird. I feel but, like uh, it's not yeah. profitable. <laughs> like, I didn't know there was a black market for unreleased books. I feel like I shouldn't be surprised because there's a black market for everything, but it's just like, I mean, like on the one hand, I get it. Like I, I know what it's like to look forward to things and be like, oh, I can't wait for this to be released. But like, I don't know, man, that's just weird. Do you, so. think, do you think he has the next Game of Thrones book? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it exists. I know it's never going to exist. I think I think I think George R. R. Martin just keeps saying it's almost done and you know, in reality he's got like you know how each title is named after a person. He's just got like, all right, uh whatever the next what is it? Uh, something of winter, winds of winter, Aria. Yeah, it's it. it's funny because um <laughs> Winds of Winter, I remember like seven years ago there was like really strong rumors around Winds of Winter and there was a classmate of mine. Every day, it's like, when's the winter? It's coming real soon. Um, I saw some leaks. Is he he, he released a chapter. It's coming. It's still not out. He has out. actually released a couple chapters. I, yeah, but, but. I, I just want the damn book. So, like, the only like the only <laughs> hope we have of Game of Thrones actually finishing the books is if he's been, like, secretly writing all the books and he's going to mass release all of them at once, which is just not going to happen. I remember when, uh, when the pandemic started, that was kind of like the running joke. It's like, well, at least now George R. R. Martin can finish Game of Thrones because he's in lockdown like everyone else. He has nothing better to do. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, I don't know.
But yeah, that was just a weird, fun story that I thought might be fun to uh, end the week on. And that was all of our news for this report. Again, we covered the Swiss Army has banned everything except Threema, which is very fun. There is that new iOS fake reboot exploit as well as the other iOS exploit. Norton has their crypto miner that we cleared up and Mozilla does not know what to do with cryptocurrencies. <laughs> Um, again, our promo this week is ourselves. We have communities that we think that you'd really enjoy, especially if you want to be around other like-minded privacy people. The New Oil, which is what Nathan manages. He has a Matrix room. And we uh, at TechFloor have uh, Discord and Matrix, and we'll leave links to all of those down in the description. We want to thank you for listening to the surveillance support. We're happy to know you're trying to stay safe out there. The final thing we ask everyone to do is to share the podcast around. Make sure you subscribe and give us a rating if you're listening from a platform where that's an option. We want privacy to reach as many people as possible and you can directly help us do that. Thanks again for listening everyone and see you next week.